Now, the rest of the story. The action-adventure motion picture the day after tomorrow thrilled audiences with vivid visions of the next ice age, Manhattan Island engulfed by rising seas, the northern hemisphere instantly fresh frozen like a bag of bird's eye peas. In fact, nobody knows what the next ice age would look like. But what did the last one look like? Well, this is what. During the last ice age, if you could have stood on the highest mountain on the North Atlantic island of Iceland, you could not have glimpsed the open sea in any direction. Nothing but vast ice flows for miles around, yawning beyond every horizon. Even far to the south, in what's today Scotland, temperatures plunge through most of the year to the point that plant life ceased to flourish. In Switzerland, glaciers roared down out of the Alps into the lower valleys, crushing, gouging, engulfing everything in their paths, as did glaciers worldwide from Norway to New Zealand. And what do you know? As New York Harbor, where all of the ships pass through all of the year, it was completely frozen. You could have walked from Manhattan to Staten Island without even dampening the soles of your shoes. The Baltic Sea regularly froze solid as well. What caused the last ice age? Scientists wonder about that. Some conjecture that increased volcanic activity during the epoch put enough dirt and ash into the upper atmosphere to filter significant amounts of warming solar radiation. Others observe that the sun itself goes through cycles of slight warming and cooling. And, oh yes, a fluctuation of as little as a few tenths of a percent in the energy output of the sun, that could be enough to alter the Earth's climate dramatically, and unquestionably something did. How long did the Ice Age last? Four, maybe six centuries? And we have remarkably precise evidence of it for the last 250 of those years, thanks to the invention by one Galileo of something called the thermometer. You see, climatologists estimate that the outside parameters of the last ice age from roughly 1250 to 1850 A.D. And yes, it meets all of the qualifications of a genuine global ice age. The famines resulting from drastically diminished growing seasons killed millions, one and a half million in 1315 alone, the year 1315. Glaciers appeared where they had not in thousands of years, wiping out farms and entire towns in two hemispheres. Now, some winter times, even in New York Harbor, solidified. And in the year 1816, there was no summer at all, not anywhere. So should it occur to you, as it has to art historians, that landscape oil paintings in the 16th and 17th centuries have more than their share of snow, you will know that what you are seeing through those windows in time are glimpses of something you thought was prehistoric. Yes, I do mean to say that we civilized humankind lived through the last Ice Age, and we scarcely even knew it was there. But now you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. The period in 1816 which Mr. Harvey referred to as the last Ice Age has gone by many other names, including Poverty Year and 1800 and froze to death, but it's most often known as the year without a summer. Some areas of the United States reported frost every single day of 1816. In that year, the citizenry of the United States tried to determine the cause of the strangely cold weather. They speculated that it could have been caused by all sorts of things, including sunspots. Modern scientists link the strange weather of 1816 to an event which happened a year earlier on the island of Sumbawa in what is now Indonesia. There was no way anyone in the United States could have made that link. There was not a single American newspaper article which mentioned the catastrophic event. Here's what happened. On the morning of April 6, 1815, people in Sumatra, over 1,600 miles away, reported what they thought was the sound of firing guns. The sound continued for four full days. At about 7 p.m. on April 10, 1815, Mount Tambora erupted. Liquid fire, magma, flowed down from the mountain to the sea. 
An hour later, stones up to eight inches in diameter rained down around the mountain. Between 9 and 10 p.m., a violent whirlwind developed and it hit a nearby village. Nearly everything, including houses, trees, people, animals, pulled high up into the air and eventually dropped. The eruption caused tsunamis, which struck nearby islands with waves reaching as high as 13 feet. Mount Tambora's eruption and after effects killed an estimated 71,000 to 121,000 people. Now, there's no way to get an exact number. Before the eruption, Mount Tambora stood at 14,100 feet. After the eruption, its peak elevation had dropped by 9,354 feet. What was once one of the tallest peaks in the Indonesian archipelago stood a mountain about one-third of its original height. The eruption left a crater about four miles across and 2,300 feet deep. The eruption ejected from between 8.9 to 10.8 cubic miles of dense rock equivalent material into the atmosphere. 8.9 to 10.8 cubic miles. Wow. In comparison, do you remember Mount St. Helens eruption of 1980? Now let me refresh your memory here. Mount St. Helens is a mountain located in Washington state. On April 17th, people noticed a large bulge in the side of the mountain. This drew interest from people all over the world. 30-year-old volcanologist David Johnston worked for the United States Geological Survey and was delighted by the recent activity. He also realized the danger and sealed off the area to the general public despite pushback from the local government. David told reporters that being on Mount St. Helens was like standing next to a dynamite keg and the fuse is lit. David was manning the Cold Water 2 observation post six miles away from Mount St. Helens and had a wonderful, unobstructed view. Other members of the Vancouver branch of the U.S. Geological Survey waited at other posts in anticipation of the impending eruption. At 8.32 on the morning of May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted. David excitedly transmitted the first report of the eruption to his other team members. He said, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. Then his radio was forever silenced. This photo of David was taken just 13 hours before the lateral blast from Mount St. Helens took his life. Just north of David's position, 64-year-old amateur radio operator Jerry Martin broadcast the following message in which he referred to David as a camper. Jerry said, Gentlemen, the camper and car that was sitting over to the south of me is covered. It's going to hit me too. That was his last radio transmission. Seconds later, the blast which took David's life took his as well. Fifty-seven people were known to have died as a result of the eruption, but the true number will probably never be known. The sound of the blast was heard hundreds of miles away. Now, I want you to take a listen to something. You may have to turn your sound up a little. This is a recording of the sound of Mount St. Helens eruption from 140 miles away. Take a listen. The Mount St. Helens eruption sent a column of ash 80,000 feet into the atmosphere and deposited ash in at least 11 states as well as parts of Canada. Virtually everything, natural and man-made, within a radius of about 8 miles was completely obliterated. Most of the human deaths occurred within this radius. Within a radius of about 8 miles to 19 miles, trees were broken off at their bases similar to the way grass is cut by a lawnmower. Trees just beyond this radius remained standing but were singed brown by the hot gases of the blast. 
The thermal energy released during the eruption was equal to about 26 million tons of TNT. In comparison, the explosive energy of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima during World War II was about 20,000 tons of TNT. Now, how does the Mount St. Helens eruption compare to the Mount Tambora eruption? Earlier I said that Mount Tambora ejected from between 8.9 to 10.8 cubic miles of rock into the atmosphere. Mount St. Helens ejected only about one-tenth of a cubic mile. Based on this alone, the Mount Tambora eruption ejected about a hundred times the rock into the atmosphere as the Mount St. Helens eruption. Ash from Mount St. Helens was dispersed across 11 states in Canada. Ash from Mount Tambora was dispersed around the world. Mount St. Helens destroyed everything within about a nine mile radius. Mount Tambora destroyed everything on an area of 337 square miles. Ash in the atmosphere blocked out the sun somewhat, which lowered the temperature around the world. The cooler summer led to massive crop failures and food shortages around the world. The eruption of Mount Tambora remains the largest and deadliest observed eruption in recorded history. Volcanologists continue to monitor active as well as non-active volcanoes around the world to better predict eruptions which will save lives. It's not a question of will another large volcano erupt, but when will it erupt and where? It's amazing yet terrifying how powerful Mother Nature is and can be, don't you think? I'm Brad Dyson, thanks for watching, and now you know the rest of the rest of the story.